will be our final and closing session, and we've got some great discussions coming up. We've got a couple technical tracks for you, followed by our closing keynote. Up first is Michael Koblenz and Jack Cole, workshopping how safer smart contract languages can provide greater security for programmers and blockchain applications. Then Dave McKay will present a demo on Mosaic, which takes an interesting new approach to distributed business logic with DLT-based data-driven state machines. For our final keynote of Uber Connect 2020, we're welcoming to the stage Ripple CEO, Brad Garlinghouse, who's gonna be joined in a fireside chat by Michael Arrington. Michael has a long history and impact in the tech industry, including founding TechCrunch and Arrington XRP Capital. Remember to use the chat ahead of time so that the speakers know that there are questions for their sessions. This is your last chance on qualifying for the engagement award. And to close out the show, I'll be joined by Ripple Head of Impact, Ken Weber, to present this year's first ever Uber Awards. Let's get started. Michael, Jack, you're up. Hi, I'm Michael Koblenz. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Maryland. And I'm Jack Kolb. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. So today we're going to be talking about a couple of different approaches that one might use to improve smart contract security uh, on blockchain platforms. Um, so let me jump right in. Um, the issue here is that many smart contracts have been vulnerable to attack. So for example, the distributed autonomous organization was one smart contract on Ethereum. Um, it was released in uh, April of 2016, uh, raised $100 million within about two weeks. Uh, but then within about a month of that, um, it had 3.6 million Ether stolen, which were initially worth about $72 million. Um, and it's not just about the theft of the money from this particular organization. It really uh, undermines the um, the, the ability of, of the blockchain um, to uh, sell itself as a reasonable place in which people can do work and do business. Um, so the question is, what are we going to do about this? Um, and the, the, the underlying problem you can think of as being the fact that writing smart contracts is hard. Um, typically, you can't fix bugs in smart contracts after they've been deployed because contracts may be immutable. The contracts uh, tra track state, which has to be maintained correctly, and if the state is maintained incorrectly, uh, well, then now you've got a big problem over a long period of time. Um, in, in fact, anyone anyone can submit a transaction against the contract at any point in time. Um, so this means that a smart contract is subject to attack from arbitrary hackers who can send any kind of har harmful input that they, that they want. Um, in addition, um, in in many smart contract platforms, we have um, we have uh, ex execution cost constraints, and so people need to carefully optimize their code in order to avoid spending too much money on their transactions, uh, and so that can make the code harder to harder to read and harder to write correctly. Um, in addition, we have languages like Solidity, where some approaches that seem like they should be obvious are unsafe, um, and we already know that writing correct software is hard in general. So what should we do? Well. Uh, there are several different approaches that people have used. Uh, one is to avoid writing software on the blockchain. Um, instead, we keep all the software off blockchain as much as possible. Um, and that, um, that might help uh, move the bugs where they can be more easily fixed. But on the other hand, part of the blockchain vision is that you should be able to agree on code that is, uh, that is actually part of the, of the blockchain itself. Um, and of course, you can still have bugs there too. Another approach is to write formal proofs. Of, uh, of properties that you're interested in that your smart contract should have. And this is great because you can obtain arbitrary guarantees this way. On the other hand, you have to write good specifications. And in addition, writing these proofs can be extremely difficult. So today, we're going to be talking about two different approaches uh, that we are considering and uh, that we've implemented in particular uh, programming languages uh, to make writing smart contracts easier and safer. So uh, the approach that I'm going to talk about um, is a type system approach. The idea is to rule out certain classes of bugs at compile time via a strong type system. Um, so, the, so one advantage of this compared to proofs is that you, this results in a lot less programmer effort. On the other hand, we have to specify what classes of bugs we're going to prevent in advance. Um, in addition, you can make it actually harder to write programs this way compared to uh, kind of not having these restrictions. And so the question is, what can we do to develop a safer language in which people can actually still get their work done? The approach that Jack is going to talk about 
uh, is called model checking. And the idea is to search possible execution traces to see if any bugs occur in those particular execution traces. Um, and then the, 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 the uh, advantage of this is that the checking is automatic, and you can check uh, contract-specific properties. Uh, but you, of course, uh, as, the, as the programmer, have to specify properties to, to verify. Um, many model checkers require, require a formal specification. So Jack will talk about a way of um, addressing that part of the problem. Um, and in general, one has to bound the search space that the model checker is going to use. Otherwise, the checking can be kind of slow. So Obsidian is a new smart contract language that uses a strong type system to rule out bugs. And Quartz is a development framework that uses a simplified contract programming language and some validation tools to allow you to write the contract as a state machine in a domain-specific language. And then the tool automatically generates a specification for model checking and implementation. So let me dive into Obsidian. And then in a little bit, Jack will dive into Quartz. The idea with Obsidian is that we were going to detect more bugs at compile time, uh, but without making it too hard to write programs. So this programming language design project is also a test bed for user-centered programming language design. That is, rather than you know, me sitting in my office and informing everybody how they're going to be writing programs, uh, what we instead did was we engaged uh, users uh, in the design process. Uh, we did formative and summative studies to try to um, inform the language design with actual user data so that we could make the language as usable as possible. So um, how does this work? Well, we start with um, users. And we try to understand who they are and what tasks they might want to accomplish, the kinds of programs that they want to write, identify key properties, safety properties that we want to obtain, and then from there produce a, a design that we think might be a good candidate. And then from there, we iterate. We use usability studies to try to identify usability problems. We do case studies to try to see whether the language is suitable for writing kind of real world smart contracts. We use formal methods to show that the language actually has uh, particular safety properties that we're interested in. Uh, and then we do randomized controlled trials with people to try to assess whether people are actually more effective at using the programming language than they would be if they were using a standard language. So in this analysis of applications, uh, we observed that blockchain applications frequently support different operations depending on the state that the, that the contract is in. Uh, so the DAO hack is one example of this, um, where um, um, the, the, um, the reentrant operations can be thought of as uh, in, as leveraging in, inappropriate state. Um, and then also applications manage important assets like virtual currencies. Um, so the idea is we can leverage approaches from, uh, from the formal systems world to, to address these. So type state is an approach from type systems that lets us integrate the types, uh, the, in, integrate the states of objects into the types uh, so that we can reason statically, that is at compile time, about what states objects are in. Likewise, we use a tool from uh, Logic called Linearity in order to provide compile time checking uh, of manipulation of important assets. So let me show a couple of examples of how this might look. In a traditional programming language like Java, the type doesn't specify anything about the state information. So here we have a light switch uh, x. So x references an object that can be in either state on or off. Um, so right now, x references an object that's in state off. Um, on the other hand, if we use type state, we can actually incorporate state information into the type. So here we say not just that x is a reference to an object that is of light switch type, but specifically, it's an object that is in state off. Uh, and now we know that we can perform operations on it, like turn it on, that may not be safe to do on a light switch that may not be known to be an off state. Likewise, here we have a reference m to some money. And uh, we have this spend all operation that spends all the money represented by m. And if we try to do this twice in a typical language like Java, the compiler says that's totally fine because, well, spend all uh, is a method that takes an object of type money. And indeed, m is of type money, and so this is fine. Uh, but actually, of course, this is not fine because we're trying to spend money twice. Um, so what we do in Obsidian is we say, well, it's not just a reference to money. It's a reference that is owned. So this ownership property is something that can be consumed. Um, and in particular, spend all consumes ownership. So this first spend all invocation succeeds, um, and type checks in particular, because, well, m is of appropriate type, m is owned, spend all consumes ownership. But then in the second spend all invocation, we can give a type error here, because m is of type unowned money after the first spend all invocation. Uh, and the, the beauty here is we can give these errors at compile time rather than waiting until runtime um, and, and surprising uh, users who are maybe using a contract that's already deployed in the real world. So let me give a little example of what some Obsidian code might look like. Um, here we have an insurance policy. And the insurance policy is either active 
or it's been claimed or expired. And the idea is initially it starts out in active state and then either someone files a claim, uh, in which case the claimant gets the money or uh, the insurance policy expires, in which case the insurance company gets to keep the money. But we're worried maybe in the blockchain about trust. And so this particular kind of insurance policy requires that the insurer put up the money up front to make sure that if the insurer goes out of business, the, the policy owner is still protected against loss. So here, when we're in active state, uh, we hold benefit, which is the money that is available in case of a claim. But when in claimed or expired state, there is no benefit left because the money has been transferred to someone else. So here you can see that in Obsidian, there are different fields that are in scope depending on what state the object is in. Here we have a constructor. Uh, so when we create a new insurance policy object, we have to pass it an own reference to money. Um, so the constructor takes ownership of the money, uh, taking ownership from the caller who has to pass, uh, pass money that they previously owned. And then we assign M, this, um, this money reference, to our field benefit, uh, discharging our responsibility to have benefit be an owning reference to some money. Uh, and finally, we transition to the active state. Um, so we know that the insurance policy is active, and that's specified in the type signature of the constructor here. Then when someone wants to file a claim, uh, you can only file a claim on an insurance policy that's in active state. Right? You can't file a claim on an insurance policy that's already claimed or expired. Uh, and we promise that if you file a claim, then afterward we transition to claim state. And indeed, this transition here to claimed um, fulfills that promise. Um, OK, so that's pretty good. Uh, we did a comparison with Solidity. Uh, this is a case study. Uh, you can see how uh, the Obsidian code is somewhat shorter um, overall. Um, in, the, in the Solidity code, you need some manual state tracking, typically. So here you have this enum states. And you um, have to keep track of which variables are in scope at any particular times. And you also have to do uh, manual state checks, which are not necessary in Obsidian because these are done statically. Well, then we did a quantitative study trying to evaluate whether Obsidian is actually better than Solidity. That is, are people actually able to complete tasks in Obsidian despite the complex type, type system? And then do Solidity users insert the kinds of bugs that Obsidian detects? Uh, we recruited 20 participants uh, for four hours each. Uh, these are relatively experienced programmers. They had a median of about six years of programming experience. We gave them a tutorial, which took about 90 minutes, and then three programming tasks. So in our first question, um, we, we, we don't have time in this talk to show you all of the tasks, so I'll just show you the first one. So we had this auction contract, and we gave people the starter code here with a bid function. Um, and in the case where, the, um, where, where this is the first bid, it's easy. You just record the max bidder. Uh, but again, we don't trust the bidders to actually uh, pay out their bids. So the idea is um, when you make a bid, you have to, you have to deposit money um, as part of that. So if you, if you accept a new bid, then you've got, to, you've got to send a refund to the previous maximum bidder. So we gave people this to do. Please fill this in. Um, and people typically write co wrote code like this. Uh, this is participant number 48. They updated the max bidder to the sender of the message. Uh, they updated the max bid amount to the new bid, uh, and that's fine. Um, unfortunately, they forgot to actually refund the money to, uh, to the previous maximum bidder. So in this bug, we're actually um, losing resources in, in the system. So in Obsidian, we can give errors about this kind of thing uh, at compile time. And indeed, um, you know, whereas six of the Obsidian participants were able to write the code correctly, only two of the Solidity part participants were able to do so in the amount of time we had. Uh, so in summary, uh, we found that programmers can be productive with strong type systems, uh, which they're previously unfamiliar with in short periods of time when the language is carefully designed. Uh, and strong type systems can statically detect bugs that programmers would likely insert. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jack, who's going to talk about Quartz. All right. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to talk about Quartz, which is an ongoing research project we have at Berkeley. So we wrote Quartz as a platform for authors to write and then validate their smart contracts with two major goals in mind. The first of these was to allow developers to write their contracts, specify their logic, while minimizing the potential for errors to be introduced at this point in the process. And then once the contract uh, is initially written, allow developers to thoroughly and systematically test the behavior of their contract before they deploy it into production where it might be exposed to potentially malicious end users on the blockchain. So, 
to address that first point, we offer a more simplified programming language where the user writes the contract as a state machine. So you trade some of the flexibility of a fully featured programming language like Obsidian or Java for something that simplifies the authorship process and also simplifies uh, the analysis process. Addressing the second point with um, validation, we use a technique that Michael already mentioned called model checking, where you can search potential execution traces your contract might go through once it's deployed. And here, the, the, the burden to the user is that they have to write the properties they'd like verified. But Quartz then um, resolves the much trickier issue of creating a formal specification of the contract's uh, behavior as it's deployed on the blockchain that most model checkers expect as input and can be tricky to write by hand. So just to talk about the workflow um, a user might go through when using Quartz in a little bit more detail. So they begin with a state machine description of their contract in our domain-specific language and some properties about the contract they'd like to have verified. Quartz then generates a specification suitable for the TLA plus model checking framework. So this is a platform that's been used to validate many previous hardware and software systems. And what the model checker does for us is basically answers the question, can your contract as it's running on the blockchain going through sequences of events potentially violate some of the properties that you've written down as, as the user? If the answer is no, model checking gives us back a counterexample or a specific sequence of steps the contract goes through that would lead to a violation of one of the properties you've written down as the user. So you could go back, take that feedback, improve your contract, maybe run it through model checking again. Once you're content that your contract is secure and it adheres to the properties um, that you've specified, Quartz is capable of then generating a solidity implementation of the contract, so you're free to then deploy it on any Ethereum-based blockchain at that point. Briefly, we use model checking as our main validation technique because it's automatic, so it searches those execution traces for you. There's no manual intervention required as with proofs like Michael mentioned earlier. It's a well-proven technique that's been applied to things like hardware design, Windows device drivers, and so on. And what's nice is that it's flexible enough where you can check contract-specific assertions. So you could say, for example, I want to ensure that my contract has some um, field or, or some data value that never leaves some safe domain of values during its entire lifetime of execution. And this is a bit different than some previous tools that are more about static analysis, where they're looking for potentially problematic code patterns and that might lead to problems so they can identify more generic vulnerabilities rather than reasoning about the behavior of your contract specifically. And finally, there's no need to actually go through and enumerate all the scenarios you want to test your contract against by hand, like in unit testing and a more traditional engineering approach. So I wanted to run briefly through an example of what it's like to write a state machine and then test it in courts using that auction example that Michael already in introduced to us. So you can imagine an auction is in one of two potential states. It's open and accepting new bids, or it's closed and the bidding has concluded. You'd imagine that it needs to keep track of who's the person who has submitted the highest bid and what's the value of that bid to mark the winner at the end of the proceedings. And there would be, say, let's say for, for our simple purposes here, there's three operations you can run against the contract. You could initialize it and set it up on the blockchain. When it's open, you're free to submit a bid. And then someone closes the auction to mark the proceedings as finished. So for this bid operation, if you wanted to go into the logic a bit more, you'd imagine it's parameterized by an amount or you know, what value of virtual currency you, you want to deposit for your bid. There might be a requirement for um, what happens for this operation to proceed. So you might have to say that the amount actually exceeds the previous highest bid. And then there's some logic you want to have executed when the operation proceeds. So this if statement is saying we want to refund the previous highest bidder if there was one. Otherwise, update contract state to mark the new winning bidder and the amount that they have bid. So on the right is, is a more pictorial or schematic description of a state machine. On the left here is how you'd write that in courts in our DSL. So you can see that you enumerate all the fields or data values of the contract. Each state transition or operation gets a block of code and bid is a bit longer here because there, there's more involved in that operation. And let's say that we wanted to just um, prove the following invariants about our contract that at the end of the contract uh, or the auction proceedings, the highest bid field is actually equal to the um, largest amount value we saw passed to any invocation of bid. So that's what that second bullet point is, is uh, it saying in, in, the, in our court syntax is the, the invariant on the first bullet. So just in the interest of time, I'll kind of jump right to the punchline here, which is that um, if you're gonna run this through a model checker, it'd find the following sequence of events that leads to a violation, which is uh, namely that um, 
when you send a uh, virtual currency to um, a recipient to try and refund them, they might actually throw an exception, which is a, a, a subtlety of solidity programming that many programmers overlook. And so here you can see that the recipient can throw an exception, prevent a future bidder from being recorded as the highest bidder on the auction. And then once that auction closes, that second bidder, their highest bid was never actually respected. And so they weren't marked as the winner. That's a violation of a property that model checking could help you find through courts. So just to wrap up, uh, two main ideas in courts are using state machines as an organizing principle to write contracts and express their logic. This helps ease the authorship and analysis processes. And then also finally, um, using model checking as the underlying uh, practical verification technique to check that your contract really does behave as expected. So the burden on the user is they have to write properties they'd like checked, but then there's no need to formalize the tricky execution semantics of how the contract would behave on the blockchain, which is often much harder to do. You can consider unanticipated sequences of events from subtleties in the solidity execution model or just things you didn't anticipate when you wrote your first draft of your contract. And then finally, for properties violated, model checking is nice because you get to see exactly how this occurs. So thank you. Uh, at this point, I think we're, we're concluded. We're happy to take questions if there's time left. All right, well, thank you. Uh, it was great to be here and I'm glad to have the opportunity to be in this conference. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to uh, Distributed Business Logic as DLT-based Data-Driven State Machines. It's quite a mouthful, and if you've gone through a bunch of presentations today and you stuck around for this, uh, thank you very much. Uh, what you'll be seeing today is the very first demonstration of our Mosaic technology. I'm going to share my screen here. So uh, I'm with the Ryerson University Cybersecurity Research Lab, and let me just jump right into it. Basically, we're an academic research lab. Uh, we're part of the Ted Rogers School of uh, Information Technology Management. Uh, we're in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And what we do is we help organizations find innovative and cost-effective uh, solutions, um, basically to uh, deal with cybersecurity. Um, we conduct research in it, and we provide training for new cybersecurity experts. And we have a, a great dialogue with the ICT industry in Canada. Um, on this project, we have several of our staff. We actually have a larger staff than this at our lab, but uh, everyone here was involved in this project. And I just wanted to give a little shout out for all the effort they put in. And what I'm going to be talking about today is Mosaic. It's, it's our platform for decentralized workflows. Um, and so what it does, it allows us to decentralize application displays, the actual workflow, onboarding of people, and system governance. So how did we get to this point? So at one point in our lab, we did a, a research project um, and it was uh, initiated by uh, the Premier of Ontario, sort of the leader of the, the province of Ontario here in Canada. And she came out and she listed a series of fraudulent activities that were happening in the real estate marketplace. Um, Dr. Mashatan um, figured that maybe blockchain could solve this and brought in a, a MBA student to um, come in and do a research project on this. And eventually a paper was developed. And so the paper uh, is titled a unified real estate transaction platform built using blockchain technology. Um, and so just instead of having a theoretical one, we actually built these systems out. We built demonstration blockchain applications. At that point, we thought, hey, maybe we could commercialize this. Uh, at this point, we, we started to realize that there were some drawbacks to the system. So it was all fine for proof of concept, but go to a commercial version, we were missing some things. So for one thing, we had you know, a lovely um, web application, but it was a central application that we had put together and people had to come to our web application. Uh, in discussion with the people in the industry, uh, they had uh, indicated that they would rather have their own um, uh, customer experience, so a branded experience that they'd like to have. They may want to integrate in with their systems. Um, so driving everyone over to our website wasn't really a, an option. 
Um, in looking at that, if, if we'd given an API to them to integrate with their own systems, then there may not be a consistent workflow. So things could be different based on how people implement an API. Um, we also had a problem where uh, in our system, we needed to have role-based access control to certain states that were going on. And uh, to do this, we needed to identify what role people had. So in our first iteration, we just had people self-identify. And that doesn't really work if you need someone to be a lawyer or an engineer or a, a banker, or there's, there's certain um, roles that people have that you, you don't want people to uh, fake that they've got it. So to normally to do that, you would have a place where people go down to an office to sign up or they would phone or they would there'd be some sort of process to go through. And that becomes a centralized bottleneck for that. We wanted to get rid of that. Um, we also wanted to um, uh, get rid of having one body in charge of it. So, you know, we were set up to run this thing ourselves. Um, that doesn't make sense. You need to have a, a distributed governance on this. Um, and it was a real estate system, which for the vast majority of people is the largest uh, financial decision you'll make in your life. And we didn't even have an integration for payments on it. So there was a lot of pieces that were missing from um, um, sort of the out of the box blockchain. And in the case of what we used was Hyperledger Fabric. Now, there were some other concerns that we, we heard from people. So um, vendor lock-in was one. So they thought, okay, well, what if, um, if we use your system, do we have to continue to work with you? Um, interoperability, if, if, um, if I start this process with one in, um, real estate company, do I have to complete with them? Can I go to another one? Um, and I guess that can be considered part of the vendor lock-in as well. Um, now, the different uh, real estate companies, the different players, they said, okay, well, the laws and the rules and the way of doing business changes. Um, how do we come to a consensus on all these changes that, are, that would come into the system? Is this just something that you decide arbitrarily to roll out? Uh, the other problem we had is people uh, don't know how to read smart contracts, and uh, I don't blame them. So but to be able to match business requirements. So if a business requirement is a certain um, uh, way of doing things, then the business people have to trust that the smart contract has, has captured that correctly. Um, so there's, there's no way they can visually inspect it. Uh, and changes happen. So they need to be able to make changes and changing um, smart contracts or chain code in the, in the case of Hyperledger Fabric is, um, uh, it's a very painful thing to do, and it takes a lot of time, and there's a there's a lot of testing on it. Uh, there's also a regulatory compliance that needs to, to come into effect here, and the regulations can change. So we looked around at, at different technologies that we could use to solve these problems, and basically we hit on uh, state machines uh, to be represented as templates. We wanted to use self-sovereign identity for the um, self-onboarding and the Interledger protocol for handling the payments because Hyperledger Fabric does not have a, a native coin and uh, I don't trust tokens built in it. It's, it doesn't really have the type of um, um, uh, capabilities that you'd have in like a public blockchain. So what do I actually mean by a state machine? So here's a very simple example of a state machine. So this is like um, a turnstile. Here in Toronto, we have a subway system and we used to have tokens you could put in. So it's locked, you put in your token, it becomes unlocked. Once it's unlocked, you can put in as many tokens as you like, it's not gonna do anything. But as soon as you push the turnstile and leave, it's gonna lock again, okay? And you can push all you want while it's locked, nothing's gonna happen uh, until you um, put another coin in and it's unlocked. So it, you have a state and you have a transition, putting in a coin, pushing the bar, okay? so. Um, these are the sort of things that happen in a state machine. So what we want to do is represent, because a state machine is just an abstract way of representing an algorithm. So we wanted to um, encode this as JSON data in a template that we could reuse. And to have these templates represent workflows, you can see it's not far from you know, locked, unlocked to um, uh, open up uh, an election, take votes, uh, tally up the votes, and announce a winner. So um, state machines are also very good for representing business processes. Um, we wanted to be able to have the system uh, render display objects. So what I mean by display objects is 
it's not uh, giving an exact display, but it's giving sort of the hints at what should be in a display. Um, and then built-in governance. So the workflow for a business process may change. And so we want to have the ability for people to actually have workflows for changing their workflows. Uh, Self-sovereign identity is a very interesting concept. This is a, a decentralized way of having identity. And in particular, this is going to decentralize the onboarding due to the ability of verifiable credentials. So the verifiable credential, you have an issuer that gives a credential to a holder and they can use that as a proof to a verifier. So let's say in the case of the real estate marketplace, if this person is a lawyer, they can get issued a credential from the uh, Law Society of Ontario that says this person is allowed to practice law in the province of Ontario. They can then um, pass that proof on to the system and then the system can read uh, machine read this and verify the proof without having to talk back to the issuer. Okay, so uh, basically it's cryptographically signed to show that it was issued by this person to this person. And uh, adding in the um, interledger protocol, uh, particularly with the pay ID and what we want is the, um, uh, the, the verification process where you re request an invoice and then you make a payment and then you can show the proof of the payment. So the proofs of the payment are very much like the, um, the verification from the verifiable credentials. So we had to build a bunch of things for this. So as I said, it didn't come out of the box with Hyperledger Fabric. It doesn't come with um, basically any other blockchain. The closest would be Polkadot has some governance, but that's for the network itself. Um, so what we wanted to do was build a, um, a template format that we could use. Uh, we wanted to have an interpreter that would interpret that um, JSON template and allow that to uh, run the, the state machine. We wanted a visual editor. Here's a version of it here, so that uh, people could uh, drag and drop and create their own workflows. Um, we want to create um, uh, workflows and templates specifically for the governance of the um, modification of these. Um, display object rendering, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. A mobile digital wallet and some use case templates. So to do this, we've had to implement quite a bit of technology. Um, so we've used Hyperledger Fabric. So Hyperledger Fabric um, is a bit different than something like Ethereum in that it provides a, a variety of different types of nodes that you use in conjunction. And it's specifically for business type applications. What we want to do is, is have the, uh, the template and the interpreter and the instance data and the context all in the blockchain so it's all protected. Um, and then the use of self-sovereign identity and interledger protocol, particularly as I said, the invoice receipt flow. Okay, so what I wanted to do is, uh, because that's a, that was a lot to digest, but I wanna give you an idea of what this looks like. So we have, um, this is our system where someone can uh, create. So what I've done here is I've created uh, four states. So I have a start, uh, and this is a state machine I've created specifically for uh, a very simple um, election. Okay, so voting. So you start, uh, you propose something you need people to vote on, um, and you submit that. Once it's there, you can open up the voting. Uh, once the voting is open, people can make votes. And once they're finished voting, you close the voting. Okay, so it's it's a very simple state machine that jumps from, from one place to the next. Um, I could put something in here where you, you uh, cancel and go back to start. I could have, um, you know, I could have uh, multiple steps in between here. Um, with this system, we allow, you can see we have a root machine here. So we actually can have uh, hierarchical uh, state machines. Uh, we can have, uh, and that gives us a capability of concurrency. Um, we have roles, so you can have, as I was talking about the different uh, role-based uh, access control. Um, we have uh, various things for um, checking when you, you transition we can have a whole bunch of uh, checks on that. So logic that goes in place with that. So what this does is when you run this, you end up creating uh, some JSON data. Well, actually I can show you in our editor, we actually um, spit it out here. So it's, 
you can see where a visual editor uh, very quickly became something that we, we needed to use. Um, so let's take a look at this uh, from the rendered side. So here's the important part. Remember I was talking about how we had a central website and that wasn't gonna cut it. So what we did was when you run your uh, template, your template actually has display information in it. So we are giving a title, header, and then some text, and then a button. Okay, there's the title, header, text, uh, image, and a button. Um, so we're passing what I call these as sort of display hints. We're passing it to the system. And in this case, we have a, a view.js component that's rendering this into a web page. Um, I have uh, two different examples. It's, it's Bootstrap 4. So it, it could look, now, admittedly, this doesn't look very radically different, but you could make these things look radically different with the uh, Bootstrap 4. Okay, so um, let's actually, let's get started with this. So this is the um, start page. And so this is gonna transition us to the next page. So what happened there was it went off, um, oh, this is a good piece to show. Um, we've got our web uh, application, it talks to the interpreter. The interpreter has a, um, creates an instance where it knows the template and then any context data. And the context data is, the text that's displayed, so you can switch languages and things. And so based on uh, this, I've created a brand new instance. So I'll create a new one again. So this is a brand new instance of it, and it's gonna start off in state start. Okay, when I click on this, this is going to um, actually uh, change state from the first state to the next state. So it's gonna do a propose, so it's gonna transition from start to proposal set. So I go ahead and do that. It says, hey, the ballot is now ready for voting. Okay, so that's this one. And then I can open voting. Okay, and so now we're open. And finally, I can close the voting. So it, it seems very trivial, but what's happening here is uh, I'm not refreshing the page. It's always staying on the same page. So if you look at the address, oh, well, that's not a good example. Uh, if you look at the address, uh, it stays the same. So we're actually um, dynamically updating what's going on in here. And it's based on the current state that you're in and the um, the default role that you have and then the transition that you're calling. Um, so what this allows you to do is you can create some very, very sophisticated workflows. Um, and then you provide the, uh, the text that goes along with these. And this can be sent to a, a multitude of um, different people. So you could have a dozen different organizations, the web applications, you can have several different mobile applications. And um, what happens is if someone changes the template, well, you, you go through a governance process to change the template. When the template's changed, you don't have to go back and change the code in all of these pieces. So if there's three different um, real estate companies having embedded this into their system, um, they don't have to modify uh, their system uh, to handle the new workflow. The new workflow will automatically be created for them because all they're doing is they're just rendering out that display object that comes to them. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if there's any questions, but I, I do have a minute or two where I can answer them. If you'd like to contact me, I'm, I'm Dave McKay. So that's dave.mckay at ryerson.ca. Um, you can check out the other work that our lab is doing at uh, www.ryerson.ca slash CRL. Okay, and any questions? So it's probably been a, a long day for you. <laughs> and that was a lot to take in. Uh, probably the best thing to do is to um, contact me. Oh, can you discuss your choice of blockchain? You chose Hyperledger Fabric, which is a choice within the Hyperledger suite and across different blockchains. Yeah, Hyperledger Fabric um, is very good for um, business applications because it allows you to um, set up different organizations and have these organizations um, onboard people. It, it gives you um, uh, identities. And uh, whereas a public blockchain, uh, people are by default anonymous. 
And that doesn't work very well in interbusiness process. So imagine uh, you don't want to have a anonymous person, um, uh, you know, taking your mortgage payments, let's say. Uh, so having that is very powerful. It's a very fast system um, because it, it allows uh, for multiple channels to be put in between the different players. Um, the finalization speeds are very fast and the number of transactions per second is in the, the 3,000 to 5,000 range, depending on what you're doing. Um, a lot of what we're doing is very small where we're just changing state. Uh, so we find it goes very faster. Um, Fabric is, is well documented. There's a, an awful lot of information on it. And while it takes a, a bit of time to learn, uh, it's well worth the, uh, the process of learning it. Um, what advantages does it give us in this application? Um, the main advantage is, uh, if we go back to my diagram here, is it allows us to um, use a database to hold the, the state information. So state data is, is shared data in a blockchain that's immutable. And so in our case here, we can store this as JSON data natively. So you saw I had JSON data for each state. We have a whole bunch of data. Um, so to be able to display this in the blockchain this way uh, and to be able to traverse it is, is very powerful. Uh, if we did this in, let's say, Ethereum or EOS or some other blockchain like that, we don't have that possibility. Um, what you end up missing, though, is um, having the native coin or the token. And that's where uh, XRP comes to the rescue for us. Great. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions. So I'd like to uh, thank you very much and hope that the rest of your conference works out really well. Mike Arrington, it is a pleasure to have you here today. Uh, for those of you I haven't met, I'm Brad Garlinghouse, CEO at Ripple, and I have the pleasure of having Mike Arrington join me today for uh, a discussion as part of the closing of Ubricon. Thank you for joining. So, Mike, good to see you. Uh, hey, Brad. It's been a while. You've gone from entrepreneur to blogger blogger in the in the positive view of it uh, to crypto venture capitalist. I know I've missed a few things in between there. Uh, I'm curious, what drew you to crypto when you first started getting involved in this part of the industry? You you did. If you if you remember correctly, when you joined Ripple, as I think you joined as, as COO, right? And then you were promoted to CEO. Right. I told you it was a terrible decision and like uh it was going to be like the end of your career and turns out i was wrong like it turns out like uh not only has ripple been very good for you but you've been very good for ripple and um and as i realized over i think what year did you join 15 16 uh 2015 yeah yeah uh, and you're right you years, didn't tell me it was a terrible decision yeah i thought i mean i truly thought it was a terrible decision not as bad as the decision when you turned down i think one percent of facebook stock in the mid 2000s um but i still thought it was a is a bad decision and um that's probably a story for another time uh but um i realized as years went by like in all seriousness like i learned more about crypto because you my friend were, were in, involved in crypto and i went from you know i bought bitcoin uh to expanding my horizons a little bit and that was really the beginning for me is is watching you blossom and you know becoming who you are today and ser in all seriousness and, and growing ripple and and meeting people at the ripple team uh, got me really interested in crypto and it kind of went from there awesome what do you feel like has kept you most interested and involved because you've been involved now i feel like at least four years deep in it the was industry. 2017 yeah um um, so it has been four years, it, a little more now. Um, it's a challenging industry. So I have always, so I started off as a lawyer and I got pretty bored within a couple of years being a lawyer and I wanted to go do something else. And I became an entrepreneur. I, I, I 
like there have been times like I was partner track at the law firm. I could have been a partner and made a million dollars a year as a partner at a law firm if things had gone well. And so I left because I was bored. And so I've always like been ready to try new things. And I think it's keeping me young. So I turned 50 this year and, and I still feel like I'm in my twenties in terms of like learning new things. And I think a lot of people become successful at something in their career. And then they keep doing that for whatever reason. I like changing it up a little bit. And so crypto has been, has been like amazing in terms of learning new things and keeping my mind young, I think. I feel similar on some of that. The uh, one of the things I think we both have witnessed is, uh, you know, crypto has a certain element of kind of religious wars and people with yeah. extremely strong points of view. You know, when you see that, uh, how do you think about delineating between the religious wars and utility versus just ideology? Well, first of all, it was surprising for me. So when we um, announced our fund, which is Arrington XRP Capital, and so we obviously have some ties to the cryptocurrency XRP, um, I just thought people would welcome me to the industry uh, with open arms as a, as a new player and, you know, expanding the universe of crypto. And I realized, like, immediately I ran into, like, a brick wall of people who who hated XRP with a passion that I have never seen before. And you're right, it's it's a religious viewpoint uh it, it is it is it is worse than even the open source versus closed source battles that we've had decades ago now and so i i, I was very surprised and, and shocked actually like literally shocked at, like the people who hated me who i never met just because i had chosen apparently one side of the crypto war um it is it is understandable now because we're dealing i i, I realize in hindsight that we're dealing with money and so it's technology it's tied to money. People get very, very emotionally involved in that. And so I just continue to try to not be involved in the religious side of it. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's the only way to really deal with this, um, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, yeah, the, the, the question I'm really trying to get to is, you know, I, I believe that one of the ways to separate out between the, I don't know if this is a word, but the religiosity and the, the the reality is through utility and you know i'm curious that you've now been in the industry yeah, for a while I, you know i'm curious what you see what what actual problems have you seen out there being solved you're like oh that actually that that, that could scale and this isn't to say there's a lot that there's a lot of no, no, i understand your it. question no. i yeah. understand your question so i think um first of all blockchains and cryptocurrencies clearly are, are a killer app for that as money I mean, Bitcoin is money, in my opinion, and um, it is more money than any previous money. It is more gold-like than gold itself. Um, and so I think that nobody would argue uh, that it, it is nobody. Even the Department of Justice wouldn't argue that it isn't money. In fact, the, our governments are now concerned that it's such good money that it's being used for nefarious purposes in some cases. So the real question is, what else is it good for? And I think that um, it's good for a lot of things. Now, one thing is it's good for is, is cross-border transactions. Now, that's still money, but I think Ripple, with some of the software you've built, has proven out that like cryptocurrencies are uh, like particularly useful when you want to get money from one person to another in different countries. Um, you can avoid a lot of the just uh, extravagant fees that have historically been involved in that. Um, but again, we're still talking about money. Um, another area which this year has become sort of obvious is DeFi. And um, to some extent, I think XRP is actually the original DeFi coin. And I think there's an interesting argument for that as a blog post we're kind of thinking through right now. But the DeFi that we've seen this year has been fascinating. It's a, it's the best way to think about it is it's, it's finance without a bank or a financial institution. And it is permissionless, meaning you don't need somebody's permission to get a loan or to loan money. Uh, you can just do it and nobody can stop you in some cases. And and we've seen these the idea that the, the word that people use is compostable. And so the idea is you build these building blocks of finance that can be stripped down to their most primitive state. And then you can put different building blocks together and create entirely new products. And also they work with other products as well. They're Legos. And that is really interesting to me. And that was really hot over the summer. It's cooled off a lot now for a lot of reasons. And a lot of people think maybe the age of DeFi is over. I think it's just getting started. Um, but beyond that, it, it's not clear. If I knew if there, again, that's money. If there was something that wasn't money that crypto is a perfect use case for, blockchain is a perfect use case for, 
I would go out and build that company. I don't, I don't know. Uh, there's experiments with property titles being on blockchain. That's super interesting. A company called Proppy that we both know. Um, and we've seen countless examples of experiments and none of them have stuck completely yet. So I, unless you thought you can think yeah. of something that I haven't. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, look, I, I tend to agree with you. And, you know, one of the fun things for me about this is I get to interview you instead of you interview me. In fact, last time I think you interviewed me on stage, you made some political statements, which I'll save for another time. But uh, I think one of the things I think the audience here, you know, in con well, well, you don't get to just say that and then like move <laughs> on. Was it political statements about our government and regulation? I, I think you were asking my political affiliations. But, oh, we know your political affiliations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think one of the reasons why your comments here are so interesting is, you know, in context of this is UberCon and you have universities from literally around the world participating. Yeah. And so, you know, everyone looking at new use cases, and I think we all probably agree that the, the industry needs to get past being just about speculation. And I think, you know, to your point, you know, DeFi is definitely the topic of the minute. Maybe that has atrophied a bit. But you know, you've made a bunch of different investments across crypto companies, different assets, different use cases. Yeah. You know, when you are out looking, and again, I'm thinking about the the audience here in context of universities around the world. Is there anything specific you're looking for when you're out looking at new crypto investments that you yeah, draws you into also, the project? I, yeah, but I'm wrong all the time. So, like, you know, like we're we're not using Zoom right now, but we all use Zoom like every day, and when Zoom. When, the, when that guy went out and raised money, I, w I didn't look at the deal, but I would have not invested in it. I thought, you know, video chat was kind of a solved problem. And if it had, if it, it could become better, it'd be a big company doing it. So I'm wrong all the time. And there's stuff that, you know, needs to be backfilled and improved upon that are multi-billion dollar companies that can be built that we're probably not even, I'm not even able to think through that. I'm always looking at the next cool thing. I enjoy doing that and it's fun. The next cool thing right now is NFTs, not fungible tokens. And that is a place where a lot of investors are putting a lot of money. We have made exactly zero bets in NFTs, but we are spending half our time looking at deals in that space. And um, and there's some interesting ideas. And I, I don't know about you, but like CryptoKitties was kind of the first real example of this. Like it, it, digital artwork that is guaranteed unique in the sense of at least there's one verifiable token that is the artwork or represents the artwork, is that worth money to you? And I, I would have said no recently, but I think that the answer to that is increasingly yes. People are, are illustrating that they're willing to pay for this unique I, unique token. And um, and then again, that's kind of like money. It is, a, it is an asset on a blockchain that's verifiable. And, and so that's side of a new thing now. And the, both issuers and exchanges and how artists can make money all that's kind of a, a new area that a lot of people are looking at. Yeah. Well, we, we were talking a little bit about some of the regulatory dynamics uh, earlier before we got on to, to do this. And, you know, there's obviously a lot of macro yeah. things going on in government this year. I um, mean, it's been a in very interesting year, to say the least, in lots of ways. One of the things that has been interesting, I think, for the crypto industry to watch is the Federal Reserve's statements about inflation uh, and yeah. certainly what we've seen happen around stimulus. Is this going to be one of the triggers we look back on a decade from now and say crypto has emerged again, not just from you know a smaller percentage of the population, but to a more yeah. quote unquote mass market viewpoint? I hope so, but I would have said the same thing after the 2008 um what you well, but to some degree, like, 2008, I mean, many look at 2008 as yeah. the birth of Bitcoin I mean, for it was. a bunch of good yeah. 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 All, all I know is the amount of debt around the world, but also in the U.S., is is staggering. And unless you're a proponent of, of MMT, which argues that money is – it doesn't matter. It's Bernie Sanders School of Economics, which is fine. Like, that, he, maybe he's right. I don't think he is. Um so unless you argue money truly just doesn't matter, just a number on a spreadsheet, um, at some point debt needs to be paid back. And the only way for that to happen is for massive inflation at this point, because the debt levels around the world are just too large for it to be paid back if inflation were to be zero or even a low single digit number. Um, so because of that, we know inflation has to come. It's serious inflation has to come in the next decade, decade and a half. Um, and so that to me makes, you know, things like gold and cryptocurrencies like 
absolutely compelling for anybody that has any savings at all and wants to preserve the purchasing power of that money. They either need to buy hard assets or they need to buy real money with it. And right. I don't know if that answered right. your question, but yeah, I'm concerned. The macro picture, the macro picture of the world right now is, is deeply concerning to me. But again, I was deeply concerned in 08 and we kind of skated through it. Some people argue we just put the problem off a decade and that's what I would argue as well. And that the problem is now much bigger than it used to be. So, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I think we're, we'll look back and I, I, I'm asking the question because I think it will be uh, the next X, you know, we can debate how many years, but the, what's going on globally right now, uh, yeah. we, we would never have designed it, but I think it's going to be catalytic for a lot of the things, you know, good for the whole industry, not just for what's going on in, across Team Ripple, but yeah. yeah, I'm going to shift gears a little bit and stay a little bit on the government topic. Uh, you know, we're obviously uh, a, a long ways past the days where, you know, Bitcoin emerged, not just as a result of a financial crisis, but certainly as a use case for Silk Road. And you're seeing, you know, regulators continue to lean into crypto, uh, some in a way a constructive, like, hey, central banks looking at digital currencies. Here in the U.S., I think you and I would probably agree there's still quite a bit of uncertainty. And, you know, you're, you have seen some lawmakers try and rectify this with recent uh, the new legislation that's been introduced in Congress. Do, do you think – how do you think some of this plays out here in the United States? Do companies and investors and even in your own investments, are you, how much of it is spent looking outside the U.S. and how much is the regulatory dynamic yeah. a factor when you look at that? So again, like going back to first principles, I think the real issue here is are cryptocurrencies a national security threat? I think a lot of people in government, sort of like career bureaucrats actually, spend time thinking about this, less so politicians. Um, and I think that battle is probably waging inside of government is, is it a national security threat because it is a challenge to the dollar? Uh, that argument I think plays out in the background, but I think it ultimately affects policy. Um, and I could be wrong on this. I'm speculating, but it seems obvious to me is the same way that we must have inflation to pay off the debt. I think governments, including the U.S., are looking at cryptocurrencies with um, some skepticism. And, and part of the proof of that, again, or indirect evidence, is how they handled the whole Libra um, debacle with Facebook. Um, I mean, they tore that they tore that project apart. Um, and you have to wonder why. Right. Um, but I think. Um, I think that what you're really getting at, though, is is the regulatory environment in the U.S. in particular not conducive to entrepreneurial efforts in the cryptocurrency world? And again, I think the backdrop for me is I think there's discussion going on at the bureaucratic level of national security threat. But whatever the answer to that is, it's awful. And the the amount of regulatory uncertainty has been staggering and I've never seen it in Silicon Valley. And I, my career goes back to the mid nineties when the internet was first sort of born as a commercial entity and the U S government backed off and we saw massive growth in this country, massive economic growth because of that in the trillions of dollars, definitely. Um, and we're the global leader still, but with cryptocurrencies, they have not provided that certainty and it has, it has been awful. And I think that companies like ripple, are beginning to see that maybe they can't stay. I'm, I'm not speaking for you, but I, I would not be surprised right. if companies didn't leave the U.S. because there are other countries with regulatory certainty. And that worries me a lot. And I think about it every day. You know, I, I, I think an interesting segue around this is, you know, one of the things that I've always found intriguing about in the crypto space in context of U.S. versus what's going on in other countries, there's, I think, very little doubt from most people following this industry that China has been very strategic, very smart about how they've approached both the, a, you know, a central bank backed digital currency, but yeah. also the very unique position they have as it relates to Bitcoin and ether mining, where they have well over 50% mining uh, going on there. And so I'm curious, it's a topic that in my judgment has kind of gotten under I'll say underreported, I mean, that's not the right word, but I, I'm curious, you know, why you think that has been the case? Is it, why it, it's maybe not as well understood or maybe it, is it not really a concern? Did, What's not really a concern? Is China's uh, advantage slash strategic investment? Oh, of course you know, it's a concern. I, I, oh, look, I don't the, know how the much pejorative here, but, well, I'll just Please give you one ahead. framework that I think is interesting. 
5G, you know, here we are in 2020 or maybe it started in 2019, but there's a lot of concern from the United States government and maybe some of the other Western governments uh, about Huawei's control of potential control and influence around 5G networks and what that meant. You're, you're saying but, you know, that 5G causes COVID? Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> I think that if you looked back, I don't think you know, where I don't we, think there's any evidence to back up that claim. <laughs> I think where we find ourselves in 2020. Yeah, look, I, I get what you're saying. You're worried. Yeah. You're worried about the U.S. from a number of like 5G cryptocurrencies. Well, it's not just the U.S. I'm not just. I, mean, look, yeah. I am a patriot. I grew up in the United States, but you know, as you said, would would Ripple consider you know ending up in another country to have clarity? And it, yeah, that's something that. We have to make smart investment decisions, and so we want to make sure there's certainty and clarity. So to me, this isn't a U.S.-China. It's more of a China has generally had a lot of interest in data control and understanding. It's the reason why you know, the, great, the great firewall of China. If next generation payments and even next generation money is based upon uh, these technologies, and those technologies are controlled by China, and a huge percentage, you know, 70, 80% of those transactions are confirmed in China. What does that mean for these, these technologies to really bloom into what we want them to be? Okay, so I think there's a couple things that you, you're talking about here. One is, is China's official policy towards cryptocurrencies, which is always like reading the tea leaves a little bit. Um, they say one thing, they mean another. And, you know, we kind of feel and know where China is. They're generally okay with it, but they're trying to control it as much as possible. Then there's the mining operations. It's not clear to me that that is actually something China cares that much about. Maybe it is, but I get the feeling from knowing some miners in China that it is it is almost like illicit behavior where they pay off, you know, power plant managers to get free electricity. And it's more of a corruption thing than anything because they're able to outcompete, you know, others with the electricity costs. I, I don't know how much of that is the government cares about or doesn't care about, but I think they're two different issues. Um, I, I think what you're ultimately saying or trying to get me to say through that question which was more of a speech is that china china if china dominates in cryptocurrency as well as other technology areas that that should be a, a real problem for the us that is self-evident what would worry me the most is ripple has now talked about softly maybe leaving the us and i'm not going to ask you especially on a public you know chat what your thoughts are on that other than what you've already tweeted, which is that you're definitely considering it, I believe. Um, is that China? Like, cause that would worry me if you move to Singapore or if you move to somewhere in Europe or anywhere else, I'd be, I'd be great. If it was China, if you actually were buying a house in China and moving the family there and the whole thing, I would start to get, I would become very sad. Like I, that would be sad if that was the place that ended up being the best choice for ripple to be, but it wouldn't be surprising. Um, and, um, Hopefully, at least Hong Kong, although Hong Kong has fallen largely. But yeah, I'm worried. I'm worried. I'm very worried. And it, it is troubling to me that it it's not that the rules are harsh. It's that there are no rules and nobody can figure out what's going on. There are multiple alphabet agencies like trying to regulate this. They conflict with each other. It is nearly impossible at this point to to comply with U.S. law in this area. And when something's impossible... People don't do it. They do it somewhere else. I guess part of my question was intended to be, and I, 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 you know, the, the speech maybe got ahead of me, was it's, it is interesting to me to look at why this point hasn't gotten more attention. I mean, I, I think well, because, you're saying, because, hey, yes. Because, no, because the, the, the media line is that, I just saw it today with the DOJ article, which I, f I haven't fully read the PDF, so I can't speak to it intelligently. The government says cryptocurrencies equal money laundering, drug sales. I mean, even you, you mentioned Silk Road is like the first killer app for Bitcoin. I would not put it that way, but like that is that is what is in people's minds. And and that is what the media pushes because that 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 sells. Right. And that that to me, like we need to change that narrative because there's some amazing things going on with cryptocurrencies around the world that are lifting people out of poverty and helping them avoid the excesses of dictatorial regimes. Venezuela is a perfect example of how how cryptocurrencies have helped a lot of people in Venezuela stay alive. Um, so again, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but to me, it's just that sells. The idea of cryptocurrencies are this back alley, nefarious money laundering system. Yeah, the media likes that, so. Yeah, clickbait, as they say. Back to your blogging days. Yeah, yeah Look, it is. Uh, it is. 
I, I want to be judicious with your time. Uh, you know, I, I didn't really do a proper job of introducing Mike as we started off here. I, 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 my view is Mike Arrington's guy who needs little introduction. But I will also say as a, a concluding thought in interviewing Mike, I think it's guys like Mike Arrington getting involved in the blockchain and crypto industry, which help it move forward and grow and thrive and not being, as he just described, a kind of uh, – you know, where some in the media would characterize it as uh, for clandestine efforts, but really for the, the constructive and betterment of society and raising people up. So, uh, Mike, glad you're in the industry. Wait a minute. Just, just are, we, are we like wrapping up now? This feels like you're just wrapping this up. I mean, just to be clear, I run a hedge fund. Like, I'm a capitalist and I'm trying to make a lot of money. Now, it's true, a lot of our LPs are charitable organizations. We're trying to make money for them, but I get a healthy piece of that. So, well, thank you for that. I am, you know, I'm a capitalist and and that's okay, I think. You know, I think it's okay to make money in business and then do your charitable efforts on the side. Um, but thank you. That was great. I've also known you a, a long time. I think we need more people in crypto, more people building infrastructure, more people building companies that are totally legitimate and c clearly not designed towards, you know, Tor, dark web, you know, drug sites as awesome as those can be. Um, I think, you know, the, that, that would be for the better. Um, and I truly hope that the regulatory situation in the U.S., and I don't know how much if it's due to, like, the, the election and governments may be changing, but I hope there's some clarity so that Ripple stays right where it is headquartered in, in San Francisco. Um, I would not like to see Brad, you know, tweeting from Shanghai. Uh, that would not be my preference. So. Mike, thanks for doing it. We appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll you. see you sometime soon i hope when the quarantine uh, gets a little more flexible yeah well. uh yep you too thank you Okay, Ken Weber, are you ready to tie it all together? I am so ready. Uber Connect, all right, Uber Connect 2020 had 32 academic and 18 industry presentations, and we could not have been more pleased with the high level of participation from our partners making this conference a success for the second year in a row. It's been a tremendous effort to make sure that we could keep up the interaction and engagement, and you did it. So many connections have been made to further collaborative research. So I think before we uh, proceed here, we want to take a moment to thank uh, the production team, everybody who made this technology work, everybody who made this uh, a relatively smooth experience for rookies at this kind of thing. I'm sure I'll leave somebody out, but obviously Devin and Reinhardt and Anthony and AJ and various other people have been texting me to ask me where I am and why I'm on the wrong link. Uh, thank you from the entire Uber community for making this possible and for making this um, such an enjoyable and smooth experience. Lauren, um, I think at this moment last year, I gave you flowers. Um, do you yeah. want to take a moment to exhale and maybe reflect uh, a moment of reflection uh, on behalf of the community? What maybe you want to pick out a couple of highlights from the last three days uh, of Uber Connect 2020? Oh man, it'd be hard to pick out a couple of highlights because there was so much great content. But I had to pick two. I think the most meaningful to me was one: the panel conversation with UCL, Jane Thomason, Horace Troublemeyer, and Kevin Hugh from ETH, because they're looking to solve tech. Use, use the tech to solve challenges brought on by this crisis. And it's something that we're all living through right now and timely and important. Um, it's particularly moving to see our partners coming together in thought leadership and in collaborative research, whether they're finding each other through Uber Extranet or this conference or Uber Slack channel, the All About Podcast, um, All About Blockchain podcast. Second, along those lines, the Zoe Cruz interviewing George Sounds, Serena Argawal and Jim Angel and UCL Provo Bartolucci on digital asset adoption. This conversation stimulated a constructive debate in the chat and really got the audience going. 
they're publishing a book on this conversation and currently have an open call to chapters and it would be great to see other universities get involved. I know that they welcome divergent viewpoints and it would just, it was just great. Um, Ken, how about you? What were your favorite moments? So many. Um, I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna bundle my first favorite moment. Um, I thought this morning's kind of block of programming, uh, there was so much social impact there, the use cases around uh, financial inclusion and driving down the cost of remittances um, for, for people in the global south um, and in vulnerable uh, contexts. Uh, I thought uh, Camille Crittenden's work on uh, everything from uh, you know, uh, improving the experience of, of homelessness to improving the experience of the DMV, um, those were uh, you know, very compelling presentations. We had a kind of a circular economy uh, presentation uh, around Bolt. We had a great session on uh, how important it is to continue to diversify the fintech uh, workforce. So it was a great reminder that yes, we're a lot of us are in this uh, for business purposes, but we're also in it together. We're also in it for each other. Um, and this technology is, you know, is still showing lots of promise for uh, human and environmental uh, impact. Um, my second favorite moment had to be the presentation of the blockchain, uh, or, sorry, the, the hackathon winners, um, and in particular, uh, Warren's uh, big three, two, one countdown. He truly had us on the edge of our seats there, I think. Um, congratulations again to PayID Secure and all the, the hackathon uh, participants. Ooh, those were good ones. Um, I think we should probably say a little something about Uber Connect 2021. If the world goes back to a safe zone next fall where we can convene in person, we will pick back up in London at the University College London Center for Blockchain Technology. However, given that this virtual format went well, I think we'll also look at incorporating recordings, recording it and broadcasting so that all of the participation can happen. As long as it's in 2021 and not in 2020, I think we'll be in a better place. Let's hope. Okay, so last order of business. And what could feel better than some acknowledgement and appreciation? Um, this year, we're proud to present the inaugural Ubri Awards. Uh, we've had a long process of uh, collecting nominations from your uh, campus administrators, and we received more than 40 candidates uh, across the five categories. Uh, we had opportunities to review uh, all the exceptional nominations. Uh, the process was tough, of course. There's so much excellence uh, in the Ubri community, and we've narrowed the candidates down to three finalists per category, and then we uh, uh, turned back to a panel of university administrator judges from each region. I should say that I was not a judge. I do not make the rules. If you're happy, thank Lauren. If you're unhappy, I would say curry more favor with her over the next 12 months. Um, so uh, please uh, help me with a round of virtual applause for the following Ubri Award winners. First up, for the category of Ubri Visionary, Best Research Fellow, we have someone who consistently looks to what extent to, to the extent to what extent blockchain and smart contracts can explore uh, real world legal problems. Um, he and his team have developed a working solution uh, for a self sovereign KYC and identity process that can be used across multiple platforms while ma maintaining absolute control of the underlying identity documents. Uh, they've built a prototype called Hot Pocket. Uh, it's going to be commercialized next year and have additional tokenization projects. Um, we are really proud to uh, make the first Ubri Visionary Award to Scott Chamberlain from Australia National University. Congratulations, Scott. Congratulations, Scott. For the category of uh, Ubri Innovator, this is resulting in a breakthrough in blockchain. This is an extraordinary student who is currently developing a very innovative program analysis tool for detecting security vulnerabilities and attacks in smart contracts. Their method significantly outperforms competing methods, has low false positive rates, and is efficient. And we're pleased to award the Ubri Innovator to Bekish Nasserzada at the University of Waterloo. Awesome. 
Next up, we have a category of Ubri Maverick, uh, most rewarding use of Ubri funds. Uh, this award is going to a university that has a FinTech center where they've created innovative programs to promote blockchain education and research at more than 50 partner universities. Uh, the center has facilitated and assisted uh, 45 professors in their efforts to introduce blockchain topics, uh, new courses and modified courses, and they've had a profound impact on their campuses. Um, we are so pleased uh, and honored to award the Ubri, Ubri Maverick Award to the Center for the Study of Blockchain and FinTech at Morgan State University. And special thanks to uh, Dr. Ali M. Dodd at Morgan State, who is our partner and uh, a gentle uh, but insistent visionary and such a great advocate, uh, not only for Ubri, but for the entire HPC community. Thank you, Ali. Congratulations. And for the category of Ubri legend, that's an Ubri alum that's now out there working in the field. This Ubri legend was a computer science graduate and formal president of their student blockchain club, where they developed a P2P training program in blockchain coding and smart contracts and connected students with businesses. They're now working on their own startup called Vivica, creating blockchain solutions to solve over prescription and doctor shopping for the opioid crisis. Does this sound familiar? The company won first place at the 2019 International Blockchain Olympiad in Hong Kong. They presented at Uber Connect last year, and now we are pleased to award the Uber legend to Nisreen Byron Wala at the University of Michigan. Go blue. Congratulations. <laughs> and Finally, we have the category of Ubri Educator, Outstanding Blockchain Teacher. This was uh, a very competitive category, and we actually ended up with a three-way tie, uh, according to our university uh, panel of university judges. We are honored to recognize all three of these award winners for their groundbreaking work to push blockchain uh, into areas of deep and serious academic study, uh, and for their inventive ways of teaching students who are hungry to pursue careers in this emerging field. Uh, the first of the three awards goes to a professor of legal studies and business ethics. He's the driving force behind a push to educate students on issues related to blockchain and cryptocurrency. He's a mentor for a very active student blockchain club of more than 600 students, uh, and he's published a, an excellent book uh, called the, Block the Blockchain and the New Architecture of Trust. Um, we are pleased to honor Kevin Warbach from uh, Wharton at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, we should also add that uh, Kevin was an early adopter of Ubri, and I think he really helped put us on the map uh, in terms of this program. And he's made a lot of contributions beyond his teaching and writing uh, and mentorship um, to, to Ripple and to Ubri. So congratulations and thank you, Kevin. Next, the next awardee is a fintech lab director who also monitor who also mentors the student club uh, which has gone on to to win a number of competitions uh, the center is ranked number six on the entrepreneur entrepreneur.com most important blockchain organizations you should know about uh, and the fintech lab has exceeded uh, teaching more than a thousand uh, people uh, through experiential learning programs, such as a two-month intensive course to build fintech capabilities that, to meet market demands, while also teaching uh, regional banks and financial services organizations. We are very uh, pleased to present this award to Professor Keith Carter at NUS, the National University of Singapore. Keith, also thanks to you for being an Uber builder. Uh, you obviously were instrumental in establishing uh, the great relationship we have with NUS, uh, as well as uh, other universities in the APAC region. Congratulations, Keith. And finally, and certainly not least, uh, this awardee is the Senior Associate Dean at this university school of business. He's been a professor and a pioneer in developing blockchain teaching. For seven years, he's taught popular courses to hundreds of students and recently developed a Coursera course called Blockchain Business Models. He has also uh, been known to teach the teachers and he's traveled to other universities to help other faculty uh, understand what this uh, new field is all about. Um, he may also have submitted the most questions and scored the highest engagement at this conference. 
Uh, we are very pleased to award the third and final Ubri Educator Award for Outstanding Blockchain Teacher to our good friend, Professor Campbell Harvey at Duke University. Congratulations, Cam. Congratulations, Cam, Keith, and Kevin. We did it. Another Uber Connect in the books. We really hope to see you next year in London. That's a wrap.